Well, good morning. Welcome to the Northern Virginia Black Chamber of Commerce Economic Forum. My name is Sheila Dixon. I am the Executive Director of the Northern Virginia Black Chamber of Commerce. And today I'm very excited about today's program because each of us will walk away with tools and tips and resources that we can take back to our communities to continue to help our businesses thrive throughout this time. Excellent. Now I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy Fox. So how many of you know Peggy Fox? Who doesn't know Peggy Fox? <laughs> um, so Peggy is a four-time um, TV News Emmy winner. Did you all know that? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> and she's now uh, Dominion Energy's Northern Virginia spokesperson as the Media and Community Relations Manager. And I just want to thank you so much for supporting our event today and being the moderator. Sheila, I want to thank you very much for asking me to be here. Uh, we at Dominion Energy are big supporters of our uh, local governments and economic development authorities and work closely with these folks and, and the counties and we are uh, just really happy to be here and to support. So thank you so much. And uh, S Scott Price is our Director of State and Local Affairs here in the Northern Virginia area. So I'm, you know, great guy to work with. and I'm, Glad to see his face when he showed up today. So no, it's good, good. I am uh, came back from Richmond, my daughter um, coming up from University of Georgia and I moved her into her um, apartment yesterday in Richmond. She'll be interning at Dominion Energy, so very excited about that. Let me get started here. Um, I'm so happy to have everyone uh, here to hear what our experts have to say. Let me just run over the list of our leaders who have taken their time to be here. We appreciate it. Everyone's, everyone's uh, seated and ready to go. Uh, Telly Tucker, Director of Arlington Economic Development. And we have Stephanie, I'm going to say their names first and then I'll do a brief uh, intro uh, for each of them and they will um, we'll have a little statement from each of them about the vision forward. Stephanie Landrum, President and CEO of Alexandria Economic Development Partnership. We have uh, David Kelly, who is the Director of National Business Investment at Fairfax County Economic Development Authority. And um, Victor Hoskins was not unable to make it, so we appreciate David being here. He's going to uh, uh, definitely do a good job for us. And we have Betty, Buddy Reiser, Executive Director of Loudoun County Economic Development, um, the Loudoun County Department of Economic Development. And Christina Wynn, Executive Director of Prince William County Development of Economic uh, Development, Department of Economic Development. So anyway, let's, uh, let's get started introducing. We'd like to start with uh, Stephanie Landrum uh, from Alexandria. So got a little bio here to tell you who she is. She was appointed in April of 2015, having held leadership roles in the organization since 20, 2005. In addition to her duties in this role, Stephanie also provides strategic and financial oversight to two related organizations, the Industrial Development Authority of the City of Alexandria and the Alexandria Small Business Development Center. Stephanie also offers advice and information to the Alexandria City Council, Planning Commission, and City Departments. Stephanie serves in various capacities on boards, commissions, and committees related to economic development and marketing and business throughout the Washington, D.C. area statewide also. And Stephanie holds a Bachelor of Science in City and Regional Planning from the University of Virginia and an MBA from UVA's Darden School of Business. One of Stephanie's favorite things about Alexandria is the variety of locally owned places that serve great margaritas. So, <laughs> Stephanie. <laughs> I'm going to have, um, why don't you come up, Stephanie, because first question is basically what I'd like uh, each one of you to talk about. Your vision for your county or city, what opportunities are coming down the road, and where do you see us going? Sure. Thank you. Great. Move my stuff. Thank you, Peggy. 
Um, one of the things that stood out to me about that um, the bio is that I give advice to our elected leaders. Just advice. <laughs> Not always taken, um, but certainly part of kind of the larger discussion. Um, so thank you all for having me. Uh, happy to be here. I'm always happy to be here with my colleagues in economic development. I think one of the things that you'll hear um, from us today, hopefully uh, a theme, is how much more we're cooperating. Um, and while certainly the pandemic has pushed us towards uh, more cooperation as the uh, disease, the um, COVID has no, knows no jurisdictional boundaries, um, we would all tell you that we were have been cooperating for years and years before that. Um, and so many of the things that we're doing today and my vision for Alexandria is reliant on kind of my colleagues' vision as well. Alexandria, um, despite what some people who live there think, is not an island. Um, we, we operate as part of a region and our prosperity and um, things kind of going well for us are very much uh, dependent on what happens next door to us, across the water from us, et cetera. Um, so I guess sort of big picture where Alexandria is today is that we're actually doing relatively well. Uh, one of the things that has been a bright spot for us through the pandemic is that people have really embraced neighborhoods. And while we've all been sort of like locked down in our homes, we have looked just outside of our doors to see what was there. And Alexandria is a collection of neighborhoods. And so that model has really served us well over these last few years. There was a uh, resiliency of our business community, but also a um, kind of passion by our residents to make sure that no business went under. Um, and, and we really see that as you walk down our main streets and in our main core. Uh, not to sort of be disparaging to anyone, but if you walk in downtown DC where there's not as much of a neighborhood feel in some areas where it's very, uh, uses are very singular, there's an office district, lots of the retail there has not survived because they didn't have that same dynamic as you see in, in our community. And so we're really sort of doubling down on that, recognizing, um, I guess I should ask this group, I mean, how many people are going back to the office five days a week? No one, right? Well, okay. God bless you. <laughs> uh, uh, very few people. <laughs> Very, very few people. And so I think the, you know, the future of how people use their space is very much, you know, will probably look a lot more like what happened during the pandemic than what used to be before the pandemic. And so for us, thinking through how we continue this momentum for our business districts and thinking about, you know, people's homes now as a place of work, as a place of, uh, you know, where work is being done. Um, so I think what's, what's exciting about Alexandria uh, as well is that while a lot of things seem to slow a bit, our pace of development and our interest in investment did not. So if you come to the city today and you look around, there are cranes everywhere. It's pretty unreal um, as, I, as I kind of traverse through the city. A lot of it is residential, but some of it are really high profile projects like the Virginia Tech Innovation Campus. Um, Peggy mentioned my, um, my educational background happens to be with the other university in Virginia, um, but over the course of the last six years, I've become a, a very strong supporter of, um, of my friends in Blacksburg because of their investment in Northern Virginia. And while a significant amount of that is at the Innovation Campus in Alexandria, they're also continuing to invest in their properties in Falls Church, um, and, and because they're a land grant university, they actually have a footprint, a physical footprint in every jurisdiction in Virginia. It's pretty incredible. Um, the future, there was a great article this weekend uh, in the Washington Post about sort of the future of Northern Virginia as a tech talent hub. Um, all of us up here worked on the pursuit of Amazon. And while Amazon landed in Telly's backyard, <laughs> even before Telly was here, um, the benefit of, of kind of the, that win and really all of the investments that we're making in Northern Virginia are now being felt throughout Northern Virginia. And I think, I, I think it can speak for those of us who worked on it. I think we're really proud that the tech talent investment, that the transportation improvements, that the state's investment in affordable housing, those are things that would not exist had not we pursued Amazon. And now we're seeing the benefit collectively as a business community of those investments. So I think, I mean, we're paid to be optimists, but I think the future is bright for, for Northern Virginia. I see every sign of, um, of recovery continuing. And while I wish I could tell you that we're in recovery and that this period will be, and we'll be back to normal you know, in, in two months, I can't tell you that. But I think all of the signs are pointing to us continuing to kind of flourish. And I see a really strong um, kind of spring and summer ahead. I talked to some restaurateurs yesterday who told me they had the strongest April that they've had in years. Like, which is incredible. Um, hopefully, there's not an, there's not another dip, uh, and we all need to kind of 
close up a little bit, but I think um, continuing to encourage the investment by our business community, continuing to find ways for businesses to plug into opportunities at the local level. I know um, you're going to. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, James here in a little bit as well. James has a little bit of Alexandria history, which is um, great. Everybody has a little bit of Alexandria history. Um, but I think there are going to be lots of opportunities as our communities continue to invest using federal ARPA dollars um, and our business community continues to reopen and present new opportunities. So with that, um, I will sit down and let Peggy introduce my next colleague, but nice to be here. I'm so glad you talked about cooperation because I know there's competition, obviously, between the counties, but you've got to work together, as we saw with Amazon and also Virginia Tech and UVA. I'm a Hokie and married to Wahoo, so there you go. <laughs> so I want to introduce Telly Tucker. Uh, he's the director of Arlington Economic Development, uh, where he currently leads a strong economic development team with more than 50 employees. He leads the team that continues to build on the momentum of Amazon HQ2 to attract more businesses, grow existing business, support the tourism sector, and the arts community. Telly currently holds board appointments with Leadership Center for Excellence, Board of Regents, George Mason University, President's Innovation Advisory Council, Northern Virginia, Economic Development Alliance, Northern Virginia Chamber of Commerce, Path Forward Advisory Council, and he's an honorary board member of the Northern Virginia Technology Council. Uh, Telly has received the prestigious Certified Economic Development designation granted by the International Economic Development Council, and he serves on its Racism and Economic Development Committee. He's a Lynchburg native and obtained his Bachelor of Business Administration in International Business and Spanish from James Madison University. Please join me in welcoming Telly. Good morning. Thank you kindly for the, for the introduction and the warm welcome. Um, thank you for having me um, here today to, to share a little bit about the future and the vision of, of Arlington. And let me start by, by um, piggybacking on something that Stephanie said. Um, although Amazon did land in Arlington's backyard, um, we are neighborhoods, right? <laughs> Our backyard is your backyard. Um, let's have a barbecue. How about that? <laughs> um, no, in all seriousness, when, when this region worked together to attract Amazon, we all recognized that it was going to be a major uh, economic impact for the entire region. Um, we, have, we have since moved from the days of thinking you know, what's good for my county um, is not good for everybody else, but we, we really do buy into that what's good for one of us is good for all of us. Um, when companies come here, they ask about the regional talent pool, and it's not even just Virginia. It's what's happening in D.C. It's what's happening in Prince George's County as well, um, Montgomery County, Maryland, on both sides of the water. And so we have done our best to continue to, to move forward in, in a regional manner to make sure we're aligned. And we, we like to call it cooperation we have friendly cooperation between um, the jurisdiction but we we do cheer for each other when we collectively have wins um, as far as Arlington's future uh, Arlington's economy is can be characterized um, historically by many federal government agencies and defense contractors a really large uh, office driven market really very little uh, industrial or other space to speak of and so you can imagine when the pandemic came, um, there were pluses and minuses. The pluses were that many of our businesses were able to, to pivot very seamlessly to work from a teleworking and um, a home environment, virtual environment. But that had a major impact on our smallest businesses, our street level businesses. Those businesses depend on customer facing interaction every day and they depend on customers walking into their, to their doors. And so we have continued to shift on how do we make sure that we help, particularly those businesses that are legacy businesses, um, sustain themselves through what will be an, uh, a forever changed economy in the way we do business. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. I think one of the other questions we'll be talking about is what resources that we, we put in place to do that. But Arlington is rethinking um, how we plan and we think about the use of space. So things like what we call commercial market resiliency. Spaces that were traditionally reserved for um, HQ offices, uh, technology companies or offices, universities, how do we repurpose those spaces? Some interesting things like um, urban agriculture, um, uh, biomedical labs, uh, flex spaces, 
Um, we've mentioned Virginia Tech and we've mentioned UVA today. Well, I, I'd like to mention another uh, university in the region, George Mason University, which is Virginia's largest university and, um, and, and proudly touts its, um, the majority of its graduates are um, people of color. And uh, I think that's a unique distinction that, that we will continue to promote as part of um, the, the economic and education landscape for Northern Virginia. And talk about regional, they have a presence in, in Prince William County, they have a presence in Fairfax, they have a presence in Arlington. They really are making an impact and, and are continue to be a tremendous partner. So we're gonna continue to build on that. But in terms of thinking about how we use our spaces, that's one um, element of focus. And then how do we continue to build on some of the um, momentum that we have from Amazon. We had a lot of businesses that want to know, how do I do business with Amazon? How do I get my products or services on their platform? Um, there's a team of individuals who sit right here at the, at the center table that are um, part of the BizLaunch team. And let me give them a hand, because they are the true rock stars. Um, if, you haven't, if you haven't met Tara Palacios and her team, you really should meet them before you leave today. Um, they do an extraordinary amount of work for a team of you know, three or four people. And uh, I can't give them enough kudos for all the hard work that they put in, particularly serving our small businesses and our, um, our minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses in the county. Um, so those are some things that we're focusing on. Um, we, are, we were proud to, to recently announce the presence of um, Boeing's global headquarters moving from Chicago to, to Arlington. Um, it's still, Arlington still continues to be an attractive place for large business as well, headquarters, people who need to have a presence close to Washington, D.C. Um, because of all the relationships that are being driven there uh, in, in, the, in the district. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing a lot more companies now asking about what types of, um, what types of work and effort is being done in terms of racial equity uh, awareness. Um, making sure that there's adequate representation and participation from particularly from minority owned businesses and underrepresented populations in the district and in, in the entire NCR region. And so I'm encouraged that even our largest businesses are asking those questions um, because we recognize that it's not only the morally right thing to do, um, but it's also economically the smart thing to do. And um, I'm encouraged that we're we are rethinking all of our programs, um, our policy, our regulations. How do we do business? And we ask four questions, um, actually five questions. We ask the question of who benefits from the decisions and the programs we make? Who, is anybody burdened by those decisions? Um, who's missing from those conversations? How do we know this information? And then what do we do about it? And so those five questions really frame our, our equity context of how we approach our programming uh, going forward. And, and I think you'll continue to hear and see more of that in the decisions that are made um, from, from AED, Arlington Economic Development, and from Arlington County in general. Thank you. Yeah, I would piggyback on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We've got uh, quite an emphasis at um, Dominion Energy, a uh, whole team of folks working on working on that and to make uh, make our company more diverse. So I know that's, uh, you know, really, it's great to, to work with counties as well. I'd like to introduce, uh, I failed to introduce Jason, I think, earlier. I want to say uh, Jason Hawkins, Director of Supplier Diversity with George Mason. So we'll hear, we'll hear from him. We're going alphabetically in terms of county and city. So next is David Kelly uh, from Fairfax County, Director of National Business Investment at the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority. David Kelly grew up in Germany and Italy before moving to the Washington, D.C. area for middle school and high school. He's been at the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority since 2010, where he covered numerous sectors supporting software, government IT, data analytics, and cloud companies. Before joining EDA, David held leadership positions in a business development career that spanned over 25 years, working for major technology organizations. In his time at the EDA, David's represented the organization's outreach to the business community by serving on the boards of the Mount Vernon Chamber, Mount Vernon Lee Chamber of Commerce, Greater Reston Chamber, and Committee for Dulles. And he's had a leadership role in the local chapter of the Armed Forces Electronic Communications Association. David's a graduate of Utah State University with a degree in sociology with a focus in statistics, research methods, and economic and community development. He is a classical guitarist and plays the piano. 
when he's not out meeting with companies and supporting the NBI team, David enjoys spending time with his children and grandchildren. Join me in welcoming David Kelly. Thank you. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, I am here uh, replacing Victor Hoskins, and he's a hard man to replace. Uh, so, uh, and I know Buddy has some jokes he wants to throw at Victor, and he can't do it today, so he's going to be feeling a little badly. But there are a couple things I, w I do want to see. I see a big change since 2010 when I was at the EDA uh, to now, and it's collaboration uh, amongst the counties. We feel that we're stronger together than divided and, and going after companies, and sometimes going after companies that really we shouldn't have had in the county. Uh, that reminds me, just a little while ago, uh, we had a company from Israel that was interested in coming here, and so they set their headquarters up in Fairfax County, a small headquarters, but they wanted to do manufacturing. Well, we don't do too much in the way of manufacturing. It would cost too much in Fairfax County, so we reached out to Prince William County and some other counties as well. So that's really what we want to do. We want to collaborate because we are going up against Silicon Valley, and that's 38 jurisdictions. Uh, so we uh, are working with the Nova 10, and some of this is the Nova 10 up here, so that's, that's fantastic. Um, so that's an, one vision. The other vision is with diversity and inclusion. We really want to do that a lot. Uh, we, had, we have a um, PR team out of New York that works with us, and so they, they did a survey uh, a couple years ago for us, and in the region and in the area, they didn't think we were very diverse. They didn't think diversity was a thing that was happening in Northern Virginia. So we really have to change that model and that way of thinking uh, to, to do that. Uh, there are a couple other things I wanted to talk about with regard to um, the different areas of our region. Uh, the Route 1 corridor is really starting to take off. And it's in part due to the BART, uh, the, the rapid transit bus system excuse me, bus system. Uh, it's a billion dollar investment over a 10 year period and uh, it'll be complete in 2030. Uh, but we've already seen signs of how that's taken hold and how companies are really looking, small companies are looking to, to, to invest in that area. The other thing is Fort Belvoir. Fort Belvoir has over 50,000 people a day come into the post to work. That's huge for us. And a lot of those are small, minority owned, veteran owned companies. Um, and then in rest, you know, we talk about the, the large companies because they make a big splash and a major hit, but 90% of Fairfax-based companies are employed 50 people or less. And that's something that is huge for us to, to tout because that's not always known because we talk about Reston. Reston is doing really well as an area. They're the second uh, just behind Tyson's. And what I mean second behind Tyson's in office space, it's just a little step away from taking over uh, Tyson's corner. But some of the investments that have happened, there are over 67,000 people that work in Reston, uh, and that's huge. Um, and uh, some of the key, or some of the big names are Microsoft, uh, Periton has just moved their headquarters. They're keeping their place in Rest uh, in Herndon, but they're also moving their headquarters to Reston. Uh, we've had CACI and Starkist has also moved in uh, to Reston. We got them from Pittsburgh, and who knew Starkist was a Korean-owned company? Uh, and so that's that's an international company for us. Um, the other things that are happening in Reston, due to the Silver Line, the growth in that area is is fantastic, and there's a lot. 1.1 billion square feet, million square feet are being built right now, and so we have Volkswagen and Fannie Mae uh, that are leading that uh, effort, along with the other companies that I just mentioned. And then we have the St. James, which is a workout facility just just opened in Reston. Uh, they have a huge place in Springfield, but now they have another model where they took 25,000 square feet and they just had a ribbon cutting and opening April 30th, and that was fantastic. So there are a lot of things going on. And then in Herndon, based on the phase two uh, of the metro, uh, the Innovation Center, that's 500,000 square feet. Uh, Arrowbrook Center is 600,000 square feet. And then Woodland Park East is 500,000 square feet. And then Springfield is also growing. But the one thing I want to talk about, Springfield, uh, we've had some big wins. Caliber Systems uh, got a new headquarters. We had a ribbon cutting there a month ago. 
uh, and then 625,000 square feet of TSA headquarters uh, delivered in 2020. But the thing I really want to talk about is the small companies that are, that are there. We have a, a company, Furnace Records. Uh, it's a, under 50 employees, and they do record pressing. Uh, this is the only company in the world besides another one in Cologne, Germany that is doing this. And um, it is amazing. About uh, eight years ago, the owner found 10 machines in Mexico City that were out in the open. And he bought those 10 machines, had them shipped here. Uh, he looked at them. They need a lot of work. So he found a UK company and shipped them off to the UK. They fixed them, brought them back here. And they are pressing records right now. And I never, uh, a record starts off as a hockey puck. And then you put the stuff on it and then you, you, you create the mother, the father, the daughter, and then you start creating records. But what's interesting is he has several organizations or several bands that will only work with him. So who knew Jimmy Page comes to Fairfax County and, and hangs out with them? He, they are the only ones he wants to produce their records for Led Zeppelin and any other bands that he's associated with. And we also have Neil Young is doing the same thing and some other bands are too. So that's just fantastic. So the other thing I see in the future for us is creating uh, a wonderful music scene. We need to create the arts in Fairfax County or in Northern Virginia and all the counties, but really create an art scene because we have other places uh, in the county. We, in Fairfax County, we have a, another place that does recordings and records jazz and, and, and actually R&B music and they're fantastic. Uh, and so seeing that and with the other counties uh, doing that, I think uh, that will help spur diversity and other things. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Peggy. Thank you. So fascinating to learn all the new stuff coming. Next is Buddy Reiser, Executive Director, Loudoun County Department of Economic Development, which was named the 2021 Economic Development Organization of the Year by the International Economic Development Council. Definitely. Uh, Buddy um, leads the agency responsible for encouraging growth and developing relationships with Loudoun's business community in both the commercial and agriculture agriculture based business sectors. During his tenure, Riser and his team have attracted more than 35 billion in new investment and tens of thousands of new jobs. Buddy has been named a tech titan six times by Washington Magazine. He's been named one of the 50 most influential Virginians five times by Virginia Business Magazine and was named to the Washington Business Journal's Power 100 as one of the most influential business people in Washington, D.C. But he serves as the chair of the Northern Virginia Community College Foundation Board and is the secretary of the Go Virginia Region 7 Council. He's on the board of directors for the Northern Virginia Technology Council and is a founding member of the Northern Virginia Economic Development Alliance. But he is a certified economic developer and a graduate of Virginia Tech's local government management graduate certificate program. Join me in welcoming Buddy Reiser. Hi, everyone. How you doing? Um, Christina Wynn just leaned over to me. She said, keep it short. So, <laughs> so I'll, I'll try to do that. Uh, and David's right. I mean, I had written an entire script of making fun of Victor Hoskins for today. So I'm a little bit light on material. So you'll have to apologize. I'll have to apologize for that. Um, I, I, listen, we, we're very excited, all of us, to be here. And, and the relationship that we've been able to build as a region has been terrific. Um, you know, it wasn't that many years ago. And, and I'm in this role for 15 years now, 15 years this month, uh, that that we haven't had this relationship where we are supporting, where we are sharing, we're all working together. It's 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 really good, and it's good to see. Um, each of us brings something different to the table. Uh, when you think about uh, all the assets that Northern Virginia has, uh, you want to be able to deliver a full range of options when you're talking to businesses and we've been able to do that here in northern virginia uh, each of us has something unique to what makes our place special yet we're all able to take advantage of the workforce and the proximity and the airports and all the great things that make northern virginia so special 
We want to kind of keep building on that, though. We want to keep finding those ways to continue to grow in smart ways, diverse ways, in ways that can really make our economies hum and continue to go through uh, anything that might come. I mean, you think about COVID. And uh, like many people, when COVID first came, we thought, you know, this is going to be really tough on our businesses. And it was. Uh, but each of us, in our own ways, worked very hard with our businesses to help through. And I know we'll talk a, a little bit more about that uh, a little bit later. But I think that the main thing that we're trying to bring forward is, is that service to our communities and that service to our business communities. Loudon was very fortunate. Um, you know, we started rebuilding our economy about 15 years ago. 2007, 2008 was very tough as we were going through the recession. Uh, at that point, Loudoun was overly dependent on the residential taxpayer. Only 19% of our tax base was commercial. That meant when the values of the homes went down, our tax revenue went down. So for years, we were laying off people. We, we had no uh, raises for our employees for years and years. So my first challenge was, how do we attack that? How do we try to grow that? And, and fortunately enough, we, we, we started working on the data center industry, and we were able to bring data centers um, into Northern Virginia. Um, today, Loudoun and Prince William County make up the largest concentration of data centers anywhere in the world. If you take the next six biggest markets and put them all together, it doesn't equal what we have in Loudoun and Prince William. But even that, you know, a half a billion dollars in revenue this year, even that is not sustainable. So we want to make sure that we continue to diversify. Our path forward is going to be in a couple of different ways. First of all, um, at some point, the Silver Line will open. Um, <laughs> my first strategic plan around that was called Loudon 2018, to give you an idea of how long we've been planning for it. In, in 2020, we, we launched a marketing campaign called The Dullest Difference about Metro arriving. Uh, now it's looking like it's gonna be, you know, probably fall of this year. Maybe. I don't know if you saw the news today, but there's more uproar with, with Metro. It seems to never stop. Uh, but that's going to be the big thing, because we have greenfield development around Metro, and uh, we think that it's going to make a great location. It's, uh, we have really two opportunities. One, uh, the innovation station um, development, which is mostly in, in Fairfax for the actual development, but most of the developable land, 338 acres, is in Loudoun County, and then Ashburn Station, where we're located, um, where my offices are. So we think that there's an opportunity there to bring a different kind of company in uh, that, that might be more interested in international or, or you know, using Dulles Airport as an incredible leverage point, uh, being one stop from Metro. That's really what we're gonna spend most of our time on. But number two is a rededication to small business and minority owned businesses. Um, in this year's budget, the Board of Supervisors gave us two new positions, uh, one to add to our small business program and one for the first time to have a, a business development manager that focuses on minority-owned businesses. So we're building out that program now. Excited to tell you more about that as the time goes on. Uh, but we do want to put a, put a flag in the sand and say, hey, listen, this is where we are. This is what we're about. And, and we want to make this sure that our community is amongst the best to both live, work, learn, and play. So thank you. All right, thanks, buddy. Next we have Christina Wynn, Executive Director of Prince William County Depart Department of Economic Development. Since taking the helm of the department in 2019, Christina has implemented best practices and programs that attracted more than $4.9 billion in capital investment and 3,288 new and retained jobs. During the COVID-19 pandemic, she led multiple grant programs providing more than $16 million in assistance to the county's business community. In her previous job, Christina led Arlington's Economic Development Business Investment Group, leading retention, recruitment, and entrepreneurial support. Under her leadership, Arlington recruited and retained 200 companies, totaling over 14 million square feet of office space and 86,000 jobs. 
Notable projects include the retention of corporate executive board, applied predictive technologies, and OPower, as well as the recruitment of Amazon's H2Q, HQ2, Lytle US headquarters, and Nestle. Christina earned her master's degree in real estate development from Johns Hopkins University and her bachelor's degree in economics from Arizona State University. Please join me in welcoming Christina Wynn. All right. Hi, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, so before I get started, I want to set the records straight. Um, what I actually said to Buddy after Peggy read his amazing bio was like, I am just so blessed to be in your shadow, right? <laughs> that is true to form, what I said. <laughs> and so, and it's always hard being last because I have to, usually Victor's here and his bio's amazing and, and then there's just little old me. So anyways, um, I wanna start off also talking a little bit about regionalism. Um, you know, I think what the Nova 10 has really set out to accomplish has been really quite um, remarkable. And really, but the idea is that we're starting to really lay the groundwork in the infrastructure because in order to have regionalism and cooperation, there has to be trust. And, and you know, Peggy said, there's, you know, we do co-opetition. There is this inherent piece that, you know, we're vying for projects because we want those tax dollars and those jobs in our community. But at the same time, there are things like workforce development and workforce recruitment and, um, affordable housing and transportation that we all have to work together on because it's good for our community. And one of the things that's really great about the people that um, my colleagues, not only are they my friends or my mentors or um, so forth, but we're really trying to lay that foundation because really in a couple years, you know, the people sitting on the stage is going to look different because we are, you know, eventually going to move on. In order for this to sustain and actually continue to stay on is we have to lay, lay that foundation so that the, the future leaders can continue on. Okay, so that was my thing about that. Um, let me tell you about Prince William County. So I love to start off by saying Everything that you thought you knew about Prince William County, just erase it, because this is not your prince, parents' Prince William County. We are in really the, the, the thrust of a transition and changing, and it's an exciting place to be. Um, you know, two years ago, our board um, became, for the first time, a global majority, uh, woman, uh, more women, it's a woman majority as well, and, and so what we have going on with our leadership is that people are making, they're making changes and they're making really positive changes in our community and wanting to really support economic development. And so what we have is just this massive transition of how Prince William County is going to operate and how we're going to serve our citizens and how we're going to grow. We're going through a comprehensive plan update. We're re-looking at our land uses, trying to encourage more opportunities. So keep, you know, keep an eye out because we continue, we continue to evolve and we're going to continue to change. During the pandemic, it was very interesting because, um, you know, our small businesses, like all of our communities, were definitely struggling. But in Prince William County, three of our industry sectors, our targeted industries, actually did really well. They benefited because of the pandemic. And that was the data centers, life science um, technology, and um, e-commerce distribution, because you know all of you were at home shopping and uh, you were getting your stuff delivered from Prince William County. Just, just note it. <laughs> Um, and so that has been really great as uh, that has kept our economy afloat and where we're going, um, really trying to, to um, build off of that because there's not much many places in Northern Virginia that has industrial land and that's where Prince William County has. You know, David said, um, you know, it's great when Arlington or Alexandria or Fairfax can attract 
the 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 office tenant, but then you know Buddy or or uh, Prince William County can really pick up some of that industrial side of that partnership, and so it's a great way um, and to go actually to go a lot of times to go after um, international opportunities, and and while. Um, Lidl, the headquarters that ended up in um, Arlington, the distribution actually ended up in Stafford. And so if we could have actually held on to that, that distribution in Northern Virginia, that would have been you know, a great, great story that way. Um, the other piece that I want to say, and I hope you've noticed this, is when I really took the helm in Prince William County, you know, we are the second largest county in Virginia. I mean, do you know that? Most people don't realize that. And geographically, you know, we span from the 95 corridor all the way you know, west to the mountains. And so they always say from the Piedmont to the Potomac. We have 14 miles of waterfront um, that we're working on activating. And a big piece of what we're, we're really focused on right now is um, really creating these regional activity centers or these nodes. So when you think about what's happening in the market right now with people going back to work or hybrid and, and as employers or business and CEOs, you're trying to make decisions about facilities and office space and how do we, how do we retain workers and how we're going to do that. And so the market is in this transition. But one thing is really true is that, you know, it used to be your first place was your home, your second place was your work, and your third place was kind of your community or your social place. And now that the first place and second place has really merged together and it's kind of blurred and are you work if you're at home, are you working? And well, I hope you're not sleeping when you're at the office, but you know, do you know what I get, get my point? But it's put this huge emphasis on third places and and really creating these really unique cool things and you know Alexandria is just cool by itself right old town um, you know Fairfax has those great like mosaic district and rest in and those are places that we want to go we want to hang out we wouldn't mind working at you know and uh, Loudon has uh, Leesburg and they're working on Loudon station and, and those places and so is Prince William County so we've got like seven different mixed-use projects going on sprinkled out throughout the, the, um, the county from the east to the west that we're really investing in and trying to create those sense of places for our community because really that is where the future is at. Um, and then the last thing I want to say is that we have been making a big push in really just marketing and promoting Prince William County um, because we, th you know, I think in the past we've often been overlooked. We've been kind of this quiet little community, bedroom community that everybody thinks about. And our goal is really to become an economic powerhouse. So I, I encourage you all um, to go to pwcded.org and just check out look under news because my marketing team is amazing and they have last year put out 84 stories about our businesses so it's about our businesses not about us it's literally profiling our businesses just trying to tell the Prince William County story and really getting that information out so with that thank you very much love Prince William County. Spent a lot of time Yay. in Prince William County. Yes. Uh, okay, I want to introduce Jason Hawkins. He is the Director of Supplier Diversity from George Mason University. And in his role, he's responsible for implementing policies and procedures that will increase opportunities for the area's diverse business enterprises. Prior to joining JMU, he served GMU, George Mason University. He so I'm sorry. I'm like I totally said that wrong. Mason Nation. Um, he served as the City of Alexandria's supplier diversity lead, where he developed strategic plans that would lay the foundation for a lasting structured program while building a dedicated support team of diverse procurement professionals to advance the city's and Commonwealth's overall goal. Jason has been active in various categories of procurement, vendor, and supply chain management for the past 15 years. His knowledge and practical understanding of supplier operations in both public and private sectors makes Jason SME an advocate for diverse business enterprises. 
He received his bachelor's degree in African, uh, African American studies, African and African American studies from Penn State, and earned an MBA from the University of Maryland. And he holds a certificate in diversity, equity, and inclusion from the University of South Florida. But right now, from George Mason University, Jason, <laughs> please come up. And you know, we'd, we'd like you to talk about the current procurement projects and process at George Mason, and can you share what the procurement process looks like for us? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And yes, uh, GMU, not JMU. But anyway, that's, that's uh, no shade or slight to my uh, colleagues uh, in, uh, in the state. Um, Thank you for, for inviting me here. Uh, this is a real pleasure. Uh, again, it's great to see some, some familiar faces. Stephanie, uh, good to see you again. Um, Stephanie uh, was, is correct. You know, we do share some commonality. I mean, as you know, my bio uh, had, uh, was outlined, I uh, used to be uh, with the city of Alexandria. Um, and there, um, you know, uh, it, 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 the city, I mean, I mean, Stephanie had, had made it very clear, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, we are, excuse me, uh, the, the city it c is comprised of, of our community. And within that community, it, there are working professionals from various walks of life, you know, whether you are in the public sector or the private sector, you know, we, again, you are part of the community and you want to see your community grow in that same instance. And I've heard that from all of the panelists here from, you know, Prince William to Loudoun to Arlington to Fairfax, um, you know, and even in, uh, in, in our case, you know, in George Mason, you know, we, again, we all have a vested interest in seeing uh, local businesses do well, thrive, and, and 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 succeed. You know that's why you know we are here as professionals. We are here to promote uh, uh, the Commonwealth's program. Uh, you know whether that is the SWAM program, um, which is uh, the Small Women and Minority and Veteran-Owned Business uh, uh, Certification, which. Uh, really provides a platform for small businesses to get a seat at the table. So, um, you know, both when I was in uh, the city of Alexandria and now at George Mason University, uh, I am a, a SWAM champion in, in a way. Um, again, I like to encourage all the businesses that I interact with day in and day out that if you are qualified to become a SWAM vendor, please, 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 you know, go and seek out that that certification because it, it there are a lot of benefits to to having a SWAM certification. Um, again, it gives you a chance to, or it gives you access to compete in uh, various um, competitive bids that are offered throughout the Commonwealth. Um, you know, another point that was made uh, by one of the panelists is that during you know the worst stages of the pandemic. You know, obviously, you all know that there were businesses that that were small businesses had had really taken the brunt of, of of what had happened and what occurred. You know, in in an, in an event that was really out of our control. But one of the areas where we saw opportunity uh, was uh, contracts that are being offered both within uh, you know local jurisdictions. Um, Federal juris, or excuse me, the, the federal level as well. Don't want to exclude them, and at you know, within higher education. So that means that uh, whether you are a uh, a independent consultant, whether you are a uh, a member of a large uh, construction firm or or a large you know or mid sized enterprise, you know there were projects. Again, the work of the state continues. Rain shine, you know, sleet or snow, the work of the, of, 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 of the community and, excuse me, of the state continues. And in the same instance, you know, the fact that George Mason University is a state entity, uh, there were opportunities for, for businesses to compete uh, for, for contracts. And that's, again, that's a good, that, that is a good sign that even in a pandemic, you know, there are, opportun there are opportunities for, for growth and advancement. Uh, as well, during the worst stages of the pandemic, uh, one of the things that um, you know, procurement uh, centers and hubs, both within the higher education realm and in the local jur uh, state, excuse me, the local city, state, and, and county jurisdictions, uh, one of the things that, that we, what, you know, again, my colleagues um, 
or excuse me, when I was in the city, one of the things that I've heard my colleagues uh, share is that, you know, that there were um, opportunities for distressed businesses who were affected by the pandemic to at least seek funds uh, from at the federal level, you know, to help them, you know, during the uh, during the worst stages of the pandemic. And again, even though it, you know. It, it was difficult to obtain, but again, I you know I do I have received uh, some feedback from you know those enterprises that I've talked to, and you know again they are still in existence today. Um, to to one of the questions that was posed to me, what procurement opportunities are available at Mason's campus? Several, uh, obviously, as you could tell, I mean, if you travel around Northern Virginia, you know we have a footprint. Uh, in, in each county. Uh, we are making our large thumbprint within Arlington with, with the uh, erection of, of the Life Sciences Building, and we're working with Skanska on that. And through that partnership, uh, Skanska has used, it has used um, SWAM vendors, uh, or, or small women and minority-owned uh, vendors. So again, there are opportunities for businesses uh, no matter what size to uh, to see you know you know to compete for 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 contracts as well uh, in the same sense uh, George Mason we are one of the so if you ever uh, go on George Mason's campus whether it's Fairfax Arlington or uh, Prince William uh, uh, throughout any of the satellite era campuses uh, around northern Virginia we like to pride ourselves as being one of the most uh, diverse and, in, and inclusive campuses uh, within Northern Virginia. And that's because, yes, our student body is very diverse. Um, our faculty and staff is very diverse. And one of the things that, one of the reasons why I was, you know, I am there is to really be a champion of, of small business and to bring uh, diversity within our, within the university's supply chain. Uh, because again, we are a community, and if we see the community uh, is doing well, they have access to opportunities, then that's 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 good for us. You know, that means that you know, again, it's a symbiotic relationship that we're trying to create, and it's very strategic. And and, and at some instances, it can be challenging, but again, that challenge is, is why well, each of us as professionals are here today. So. I want to encourage uh, any uh, individual uh, that is listening that if you are interested um, in opportunities, please, please go to George Mason University's website, uh, www.gmu.edu. Go to our fiscal services department, and um, again, go ahead and peruse and see what um, opportunities are available. Um, again, if, if if by any chance you know if that is. Uh, too much. Uh, again, please speak with me uh, after the event, and I'll be happy to, you know, exchange my credentials with you. And you know, again, we can talk shop that at another time. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out, since you know, we're you know, one of the things I'm, I've also heard is that we are one of the I, I, the points that I heard articulated by some of the other panelists here today is that you know we are this is a collaborative cohesive group and in the same instance within higher within the higher education realm um, that is uh, evident um, or excuse me that collaboration that cohesiveness is is evident within higher education I should have said that excuse me what that means is that George Mason University is part of a group of other uh, or a, a collaborative group uh, or a, a really a, a networking group uh, that is comprised of, uh, of ourselves, George Mason, uh, James Madison, Radford, VMI, uh, UVA, uh, Virginia Tech, ODU, uh, VCU. Uh, I'm sure there are others that, I'm, that, that are there on the list, but we are all there. I mean, and we share, you know, information about what contracts are are, are, are upcoming uh, that will be advertised uh, to the public to, to compete and bid on. Uh, and we try to be as open and transparent, not only within our own network, but also with, uh, you know, uh, with the community as well. Because again, we have a vested interest in seeing businesses within our community thrive. So if there is any way that we can provide uh, access to, uh, to opportunity, we are there, even though we are a university, even though our realm is higher education, we want, again, we have multiple departments, we, we have multiple opportunities for, uh, uh, for, for contracts uh, to, uh, to, to bid. Um, 
And again, I, the future is looking bright, to, to say the least. Um, I could say more, don't want to be long drawn and winded, but uh, with that being said, I want to, again, thank you for inviting me here, and I will pass the baton back to, to you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I would like to open it up to the audience. If you have a question, we are ready to go. Uh, I can throw another one out, but um, anybody with a question out there, specific? Well, think about it. And, uh, but I, I wanna throw, uh, basically, what, what obstacles do we have? I mean, uh, looking forward, uh, we, just, we just, we didn't really get through COVID, but we're on kind of the out, outer edge of uh, COVID. And you know, the number that really struck me that David said was that 90%, right, 90% of employees work, for, no, that's right, 90% of the businesses have 50 employees or less. That's incredible. So many small businesses, I mean, you can go down the, you know, for restaurants closed, I mean, I'm still looking at empty storefronts. Is that um, an ongoing problem? Uh, how, do you, how do you deal with that? Because our, our economy still is great, but not for everybody. So um, can someone come up here and talk about how you, how, we, how do we navigate that? Hopefully you can hear me. Um, I'll start since Sheila gave me the mic first. Um, <laughs> Uh, point well made, um, in Arlington, 90, about 92% of our businesses have 50 or fewer employees, um, which is over 6,000 businesses. And um, you're right, they have, many of them have seen, they have been impacted um, exponentially greater than some of the larger businesses. And so some of the things that we've been doing, particularly our, our legacy, oh, I would describe our legacy owned businesses, Many of them we learned did not have robust online presences. They did not have, they were not doing business, some not regionally, nationally, certainly not globally. Um, and they really depended on that customer walking in their door. And given the changes that have happened and the way that business is conducted, we, we kept asking ourselves, how do we connect them with a world of consumers of good for their goods and services? How can we help them find those customers? So. Um, the team that I mentioned earlier, the BizLaunch team at AD, which is sitting right here, came up with an idea for a program called Relaunch, where we basically, we have consulting firms on retainer to provide technical assistance in a couple of areas, finance, um, business legal services, marketing, um, those are three areas. And then the fourth that I think is really critical is helping them develop an e-commerce or an or, or a online presence for their company. And so we have a firm that's actually owned by a minority um, who actually builds websites and e-commerce tools for small businesses in Arlington. It's about a $10,000 value to a small business that they don't have to pay for if, they're, if they go through the program. Um, and we've seen tremendous support. And, and some, of these, some of the sites and the, the anecdotes that have been shared by the business owners are just remarkable about what it's done for their business because it's unlocked a whole new um, market of, of consumers and customers for them that they would have never had. So it's, we, we saw that as a role that we could fill to help our smaller businesses think about not just a customer that lives in this immediate area, but customers really all over the world and how do we offer them the opportunity to, to tap that um, customer base. Well, I, I will tell you that um, I, I have a lot of worries about the economy right now um, between the inflation and all the challenges that are going on. Um, and I, I think on some levels, this is hurting many businesses even worse than COVID because there are no real programs to get out there and help right now. Um, you know, I was talking with a, a company just the other day who was saying their employment, their wages are up, uh, the cost of goods are up, uh, the cost of transportation is up, cost of gasoline is up, and yet they feel like they only have a very slim margin to raise their prices. So I think that, that we have to make sure that we're, we're watching our businesses now as closely as we did during COVID. Uh, I think all of us up here spent a ton of time and a ton of resources. You know, we all gave away millions to our, to our small businesses in order to help during COVID. But let's not forget them now because 
you know, between the, the, the trouble hiring and, and the cost of, of everything that they have to do and the slim margins they were already operating on, I think that we really have to make sure that we're doing the right things now uh, in order to go forward. No, thank you for the, uh, for the question. Uh, we had a mantra started by Victor that said, save a job, save a household. And so we really focused on that. And so our market intelligence group sent out a survey, and we had right around 300 companies answer that survey. And these were small companies. 67% 67 per, 67 of them were companies that we would normally work with. 33% were not. So our business investment team uh, went out and we talked to each one of those companies. Uh, we got on the phone, we talked. They just wanted to be heard, that's the first thing. They wanted to be heard and they wanted to share what was going on with them and then we pointed them in the right direction, whether it was PPP loans, RISE grants, other things. Uh, and we, we really worked with them uh, to get them going. But it went from save a job to create a job and save a household as well. So with that, we started in 2020, we started the Talent Initiative Program. And um, that started just before COVID. But once COVID hit, we pivoted and we went straight to hotel and uh, retail workers who were losing their jobs. And we found out, we have an office in Berlin, we found out from them that uh, Lidl was actually hiring people that were working in hotels and other places and uh, so we did that here, and that was our first virtual career fair. And we worked closely with Amazon Warehouse, Costco, and several other organizations that were hiring people in that area. And so the people could stay at the hotel, they wanted to continue working there, but be employees of Costco or Amazon Warehouse until the hotel could hire them back. We don't know what happened if the, if the hotels hired them back and they wanted to go back or they liked where they were working at Amazon Warehouse. But that was one thing that we really focused on. And the next thing is, with the Talent Initiative, we have carried on with virtual career fairs. And most of those have been with universities, uh, hooking up people who are looking for jobs right out of the university into working, as well as high-tech jobs. And we just had a career fair with Fort Belvoir. This was our second one. And we usually have 50 companies or more, and they can be small or large. Uh, and uh, that was very successful. It was in person one day and virtual the next day. And so that's where we're seeing kind of a hybrid model in that. But the companies don't pay for anything. We pay for it all. And the people that are looking for jobs, uh, it's free to them as well. And we really do focus. And we're trying to get the numbers, but companies don't want to let us know that they hired. Uh, we do know that they went on to a second interview or those kind of things. But that's what we're trying to do, uh, especially with the talent initiative, to try and get people uh, back working. So that's, that's our focus. Great. I got a mic here. You can keep your, anybody, any other questions? Yes. So I was gonna say something um, maybe a little controversial. One of the positive things that might come from our experience in COVID is that people who have lived in this region because they had to for their job can leave. Controversial. Why might that be good? We need to deploy every possible tool to alleviate the pressure on housing costs, essentially to solve problems. And so if some of that means people might leave who don't want to be here, that makes room for people who do want to be here or need to be here. Um, I say that with a very personal um, effect in mind because my partner does not want to be here and is gone. Um, and, and he is taking advantage of remote working. He's a federal government employee and has not been called back to the office in more than two years. There are lots of people, there are lots of our neighbors who are experiencing this and I think are rethinking. So the large shuffle that might happen or that is happening and might continue to happen, I believe could be a key part of us helping um, our hospitality workers, our restaurant workers, our um, uh, fitness company workers, entrepreneurs who are just starting out who need and want to be in our communities but can't find housing to do that. And that is one piece of multiple tools that I think all of us are looking at to help alleviate housing costs. It is our biggest threat in this region. Um, and I think with all of this prosperity, with all of these amazing companies that we're attracting that pay highway 
wages, the downside is that we're adding more pressure right on housing costs. And at, you know, I said during my comments, one of the great things about Alexandria that made our community kind of resilient was not that the federal government, I'll call out the Patent and Trademark Office that employs 8,000 to 10,000 people. They didn't bring anyone into the business. Your business stayed open. Your business employed people. You're where I went when I finished my work day you know, at home and wanted to blow off some steam and sit outside. Your companies and the people who work in those companies, we need to be thinking through how they continue to live in our communities because housing is sort of the number one issue that drives almost everyone's decision about where they work. So off my soapbox, but, um, but I do think that that's something we have, we have different opinions and different scenarios in our 10 jurisdictions, but all of us I think are struggling with the rising cost of housing and the disconnect between what people make in a wage and what the housing costs. How many people here have known someone who, who's left, who's moved away, work from home? Yeah, a couple of people in my neighborhood sold their houses, took advantage of the, the housing market. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, but then also, on the flip side of that, people who don't live here can take the jobs and still stay where they are, so sort of interesting. I, I was wondering also, um, in terms of working from home, what is that gonna do for companies that have these buildings that aren't really being used? Housing. Conversion. Housing conversion. Can you talk about that? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so, Al so Alexandria, uh, this is an area where we kind of punch above our weight class. We're the number six jurisdiction in the entire country leading the way in converting commercial, obsolete commercial buildings to uh, residential units. This started pre-COVID and we've only seen increased demand. Um, if I were standing at this podium six years ago, I would have told you we need to preserve every square foot of commercial space because we need kind of the appropriate mix. The reality is it's one of the tools that we have to address the, our housing stock. So we have office buildings that, frankly, will never be reused again because they're too big, their footprints are obsolete, they're not literally right on top of Metro, um, and we are now allowing slash encouraging the conversion to housing units. Are they all affordable? No. But one of the tools that all of us, I think, need to employ is more housing of all shapes and sizes will help bring down kind of pressure. Um, so I think that's one tool. DC is um, kind of not represented here because we're talking about Northern Virginia, but DC is actually looking to incentivize conversion of old office buildings in their commercial core. Uh, part of what I said earlier about how their restaurants and service businesses didn't do well because there wasn't a mixture of uses. They're recognizing kind of the success here in Northern Virginia and trying to encourage and incentivize the conversion. So that is absolutely, um, I think, a strategy that you'll continue to see deployed throughout Northern Virginia. And uh, a lot of these buildings, when you think about them, were um, were built with some of the amenities that a lot of us want and need now in apartments, you know, open space, gym rooms, some of them have, you know, roof decks, et cetera, and so they really do lend themselves to that conversion. Just to add um, one more thing to that, the um, Arlington is doing the same thing. We're really seeing a lot of momentum in converting traditional office spaces that are, have been, that are now underutilized into um, some sort of residential or mixed-use space. There was some legislation introduced at the federal level last year, but it did not move forward. But it was to provide a federal tax credit for developers to actually convert, uh, if it was in a downtown area and the building was of a certain age, to convert, to give a tax credit, a federal tax credit that could be syndicated and provide capital towards developers that redevelop those into some residential space. I'm hopeful that that will come back again. Um, at, the, at the federal level and that Virginia might even consider doing something similar. They do it on the historic structure side now, but, but I think there would be um, merit in, in doing something similar to, to encourage housing. Um, I agree, it, it, cost is, is a major concern um, and we are doing everything we can to, to invest in Arlington and affordable housing. Um, you may have read Arlington made a $150 million loan to preserve uh, affordable housing for 99 years for one development. We had Amazon investing uh, additionally $170 million into that same development. Um, so lots of money going into that because that's, that provides um, housing for many of the people that want to be here and that need to, to be here. And I just wanted to add one thing to the previous question from the restaurant owner. Um, if you're not familiar with La Casina VA, La Casina VA, make sure we get tapped in there. They're doing an amazing job with providing bilingual training for people in the culinary industry, um, both on the job and, and training for them. So I just want to make sure that's a resource that people are aware of. 
I just, I just wanted to add to that. Uh, affordable housing is one of Victor's uh, biggest uh, points that he wants. His, his legacy, he, he wants to change that and, and make that happen. And as they're talking about office buildings changing, uh, the Sheraton Premier in Tyson's is no longer the Sheraton Premier, and that is being turned into uh, apartments, and it's supposed to have affordable housing. So, um, thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll just say, um, uh, we expected that there would be a lot of rules <laughs> and strings that came with federal dollars, um, and we're doing our best, I think, to, to follow all of those protocols. But there are lots of really innovative programs that many of our jurisdictions are using the funds for. Um, I'll, I'll point out two in Alexandria um, that are very complicated. So we're doing a pilot guaranteed income program, um, which is for the least fortunate members of our community, guaranteeing them a certain amount of money each month. And they can use it for whatever they want pay for the rent, pay for food, et cetera. Um, as you might imagine, we receive the money from the federal government, we're using a community partner to give that money out, and then the money eventually goes to someone else. The trail of tracking all of that money and the reporting, et cetera, is very burdensome. And so just in general, what I'm seeing um, just in the city of Alexandria is we have something like 80 programs that we're using ARPA funds for, and there's a whole institution now of people who we've had to hire to track and monitor moving forward. And I'm not sure, I guess maybe that's a little bit of job creation, but um, I'm not sure that that's exactly what was envisioned. Um, and so uh, I realize I'm asking you a really big question as to kind of loosen up and allow for flexibility and innovation. Um, but I do think that that's something that, that we're all sort of recognizing. On the business front, we're doing um, one of the things that we're about to launch with our latest um, round of, or tranche of ARPA funds, I think that's what we call it, is our city council set aside $500,000 for minority business incubation. We haven't yet defined exactly what that looks like, but we're looking at doing a mixture of direct grants, but also kind of funding minority entrepreneurs. Um, I imagine similar, you know, a similar set of challenges we're going to have. Some of that's going to be deployed through my office, some of it will be deployed through other community partners, but eventually we want the money to end up in the hands of the business community or buying them services. But the tracking and the procurement, and we love procurement, but you know, all of those things add layers of bureaucracy and I think during a pandemic um, in the early stages of the pandemic a lot of us were able to just say it's a pandemic we need to do what's best for people we need to save lives it's health safety and welfare we're to the part of the pandemic now where it's like oh no no those rules that you waived you got to go back and you got to do those and so just sort of thinking through how um, how we might be able to loosen and slash encourage innovation through federal funding because it has been game-changing for us as local communities. It's helped close the gap um, in lost revenues, but it's also allowed us, I think, to provide some really critical services to our business community um, and residential community. So thank you for your question and thanks for your leadership. Yeah, so what Steph's saying is faster and easier, if you can, <laughs> you can make that happen. Um, my point would be more for the businesses um, one of the things that we saw, especially for the PPP loans, that those companies did, that did not have pre-existing banking relationships really struggled. So, um, you know, one of the things that we have proactively started to work on is, is making sure that those relationships again, uh, exist um, because businesses that didn't have those relationships found it really hard to build those relationships during COVID and qualify for those. So. Uh, that's a big, big part of this. Make sure you have those, those, those contingencies in place before you need them. I'll just add one more quick thing. The money that came down to communities to use for um, community business support, we were not able to use those for things like revolving loan funds or micro loan funds. They were restricted to grants only. It would have been really helpful if we had the flexibility to, to use federal funds to create these programs, particularly targeted to um, small women and minority-owned businesses. So it's a future recommendation. I'm at the end of the line, so every time I go to get up, somebody else beats me to the punch. <laughs> I have so much to say. <laughs> um, no, I think, um, I, in addition to everything that my colleagues have said, one of the other pieces, especially with ARPA, um, that I noticed was there was a there's a rule about um, 
you could do things outside of loans or grants and, and so forth um, for small businesses and tourism, but any other kind of creative programs had to have been started pre-pandemic. And I think that really has limited all of Virginia because I know my colleagues, I know me, we have really create, creative ideas that we're like thinking about, okay, economic, um, resiliency how do we invest in the future not just necessarily in terms of micro grants and loans or these other things but how do we actually generate more economic development and that that criteria that you had to have been starting it right before the pandemic that really kind of you know x'd out a lot of things the workforce program uh, in Prince William County, we so we do have, we had it under the CARES Act, we, we relaunched it under ARPA, uh, it's our Elevate Workforce Program, it's for residents as well as employers um, that need to hire people and so there's certifications and job training, but it is interesting because it was it was very challenging during the pandemic and the height of it, and it's still even challenging now. As much as we continue to promote and get the word out, at the end of the day, you know, and, it, and the workforce issue is crossing across all businesses, from retailers to large businesses, and it's all industries that people are not able to find workers. And I don't know the last time that you all have kind of been on a road trip and you know it's 10 o'clock at night and you need to use the restroom and you think, okay, I'm gonna go to the gas station and like the gas station is like, nope, sorry, we're closed because we don't have any staffing, right? You know, so, sorry, that was a very personal story. <laughs> I was tra traumatized to it. But, um, <laughs> so, I mean, I, th I think that's a national level, a national problem, and I think that all of these levers that we're trying to work on in terms of affordable housing and being able to kind of release release that um, valve pressure is all really huge and, and will make an impact. But I do think the next couple of years are going to be really hard as kind of the market starts to kind of get situated and really figure out how, what does really the new normal in a business sense really mean? Um, uh, so last week, um, uh, we broke ground on what was formerly called the Landmark Mall. And for somebody who grew up in Alexandria, um, it was it was an exciting day, but a little bit nostalgic. Um, but Landmark Mall is going to be the home to the new Inova Alexandria Hospital, a billion dollar uh, new hospital and cancer center. Inova is the largest uh, hospital uh, system in Northern Virginia. And in addition to building the new uh, Alexandria campus, they are expanding in the Springfield area as well. And they're also building a new emergency facility in Potomac Yard, uh, AKA National Landing South. Um, <laughs> still trying to make that happen. Um, and so, uh, so just those three projects alone are thousands of new jobs. Um, those just happen to be healthcare projects that I'm aware of. Uh, I think that when you think about our continued growing population, I can't imagine that there aren't other investments happening in healthcare systems throughout Northern Virginia. Another area I think maybe that I'd mention to you as something to look into is tomorrow morning we're opening um, a new senior living facility in in Potomac Yard slash National Landing South called The Landing. And I think we're seeing a significant number of um, operators in that field coming into this market. As I talk to them, one of the things that's been very fascinating to me is the reason that the senior living companies are interested in coming to Northern Virginia is not because of the number of people who are 70 plus, it's because of the number of people who are 45 to 65. They have money and they want their elderly family close. And when they make decisions, and if they're the ones paying the bills, they're looking at that population and the growth in that population as their kind of indicator for growth. So obviously they have a huge healthcare component because of who they're housing and, and, and dealing with. So. Um, I'm not writing your business plan for you, but giving you a little bit of inputs, I see a lot of growth in that area, and I would imagine that all of those people are going to be struggling with the same sort of hiring issues we've been talking about throughout other industries. Just 
real quickly on that. Uh, yeah, it's a 100,000 square foot area in Springfield, and it will be ready in 2022 uh, near the end. And then, which uh, Stephanie was talking about with regard to uh, facilities for the elderly, there's a new one that's being built in Reston. There's another one that's being built in Tyson's. Uh, and there's another one uh, we haven't been made aware of where it's actually going to be built, but there's another one. So there are three just in Fairfax County that are being built, and these are large residential uh, and they need staffs, so. Okay, um, on the healthcare front, uh, same as, as my colleagues in Prince William County, I mean, Kaiser, uh, Santera, UV, UVA Health, and Nova all have very major presences um, opening up very large, large facilities. The other thing, though, I wanted to say is, um, and I'm not sure if you know this, um, but George Mason University, the SciTech campus uh, in, in Prince William County, about two years ago, uh, it really engaged upon a um, feasibility study to create a medical school at the SciTech campus in Prince William County. The pandemic happened, kind of things kind of, uh, you know, kind of came to a standstill. But my understanding that President Washington from George Mason University is re-engaging around creating that medical school. And so I think in terms of healthcare, it is here to stay and, it, you know, it is definitely a very growing and thriving industry in Northern Virginia. She took the words right out my mouth. I'm so sorry. But, but you know what, ladies first, I am a gentleman. So, no, but to your point, you had uh, said, made uh, a, a comment about the SWAM um, certification. I will say that if you are SWAM certified, uh, that it does give you access to the state's procurement website. It's called e-procurement or EVA. Uh, and so what it is, it's just a, it's a portal that allows you to search all of the counties, local government, jurisdictions, higher ed, I think that we're, we're on there as well. And, and again, uh, I know the medical, the healthcare industry is, uh, again, an, another category that is booming, thriving with opportunity. Please, I would encourage you to, to look. Uh, in terms of the actual certification itself, now there, there is a couple of hurdles that, that uh, you know, one would have to jump through, uh, in a, or excuse me, get through in order to obtain the certification. But uh, I guess if you have time afterwards, we can talk about that, and uh, I can you know give you some tips and tricks. But I would encourage you, please uh, you know uh, apply for it as soon as you can, uh, because really it's all about timing. Uh, uh, and again, l not speaking for for our um, my my colleagues in Richmond, but you know before the pandemic, um, it took when I was in the city, you know I was told that it took anywhere from about maybe about 60 to 90 days, you know, to go through an application because again, you can imagine with so many businesses in Virginia, everyone is trying to apply for that certification. Um, and with the pandemic, you know, that sort of prolonged, you know, the application review time. But now that we're getting back to, a, you know, a, a hybrid status, um, you know, that number, um, from what I understand from, from my colleagues, you know, they're, they're trying to get through some of the backlog and go through some of the applications because, again, they want uh, access to opportunity. So please uh, go ahead and apply. Well, it's a little bit outside of my area of expertise, but I will say that in Arlington, the lion's share of our CARES Act funding and ARPA funding was distributed um, through many of our partnerships with um, community nonprofits. Um, the, what we call DHS, the Department of Human Services in Arlington, really is the I think the funnel by which most of those services are provided and those funds do go out. But I think some, I would say probably 60% of the funding from Arlington um, did trickle to providing those services that you speak of, and whether it's food provisioning, housing, uh, other social safety net um, services that were needed by the community. It's really been a point of emphasis for Arlington to make sure those needs are, those basic physiological needs are met first. So I would, if I had a recommendation, and I, I'm happy to connect you with 
um, the leader of that department within Arlington, um, that would be the place I would start. So in Prince William County, um, you know, again, kind of economic development is really focused on, you know, the, the business community. But as nonprofits are part of the business community, when we designed all of our grant programs and initiatives, we made sure um, that nonprofits could be eligible for those programs. In kind of the second phase of um, ARPA, through the county's social services um, and uh, community service agencies, uh, which we actually coordinate very closely on, uh, a lot of that money had gone, the ARPA money and the federal money had gone to um, those different agencies and to the Human Service Alliance, um, which really then became the entity that worked with all of our nonprofit and um, community service organizations throughout the county to ensure that they were um, getting funding. But we also really coordinated closely um, just trying to identify and understand, okay, this, this type of nonprofit, it's getting funding over here. Okay, we're funding these nonprofits over here to ensure, to make sure that we were getting the money out and that we weren't creating kind of any arbitrary rules that would eliminate or cause a problem for nonprofits. Um, so we did a lot of work in that area just to make sure that we were really nurturing and helping and providing the support because it's the nonprofits that really were servicing our residents and our community members and we wanted to make sure that that they those organizations were very stable um, first of all today was the first time i had heard nova 10 so I would have probably gone with Nova 9, and maybe the next time we have to vote somebody off the island. I'm not sure who that would be. Um, but um, it is the Northern Virginia Economic Development Alliance, and uh, it's something we started, I guess, going on three years ago. Um, it, we've always had a loose group together where we talked and, and through different forums, uh, but we're trying to formalize that a little bit more. Uh, we were the recipient of a Go Virginia grant just last year um, where we're actually going to put a, a real organization in place. Um, you know, it, and it's going to be focused on, on a lot of different things. Um, you know, a lot of the business development we have to do is local, but, you know, when it comes to attracting people to the region, when it comes to uh, workforce, when it comes to those cross-jurisdictional things, um, we have found it very valuable. So we'll continue to, to, to go forward on that. Uh, as far as transportation, I, I, I mean, from my standpoint, the, uh, the Transportation Alliance and, and the NVTA and the NVTC and all those things have probably, you know, they're, they're ahead of us when it comes to collaboration and cooperation. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that there's always going to be jurisdictional challenges. Um, you know, there is not a lot of money in the state budget for roads anymore. It's just, there's just, it's just not there. We in Loudoun have had to put a lot of local money into roads. Um, you know, in order to maximize Metro, we had to build the road networks to be able to get people to Metro. So we've put in more than a billion dollars in the local roads just around that project over the last uh, um, five to seven years. So um, I think that you're starting to see better collaboration across all of the different things, uh, affordable housing and, and, and emergency response and, and all of those things. but. Um, I, I do think that uh, we're proud of the, the steps we've taken with the Nova 9 plus 1, and we'll continue to look at those opportunities as, as we go forward. Thank you. So uh, I'll just say, um, Buddy failed, because really the test of being a member of the Nova 10 is if you can name all 10. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, uh, we, we go by Nova EDA, and so uh, as Buddy said, that, that, that is, it's Alexandria, Arlington, Falls Church, City of Fairfax, Fairfax County, Prince William County, Loudoun County, Manassas, Manassas Park, and Fauquier County. From, thank you. Um, but uh, <laughs> but I, I, I had a little bit of an advantage, though, because I wrote um, <laughs> the, the initial kind of document. So anyway. Um, 
what I wanted to say about transportation is um, is that I think we all are um, are really really hopeful that our metro system that frankly serves all ten of our jurisdictions or most of the ten jurisdictions um, can get its act together um, and that's just very blunt we are continue to have delays safety issues there was you know more upsetting news yesterday from the system but we are all as jurisdictions extremely committed to it and its success is paramount to the success of this region um, we have a 500 plus million dollar metro station delivering in Potomac Yard this has been kind of the, the cornerstone of growth for Alexandria for decades. We are ready to open it, and we've had like a safety and procurement delay. Um, so there are there are constant kind of frustrations there, but we all know that making sure that this area does not remain congested as we move forward in recovery is really, really critical. Um, maybe one other big idea that we've been batting around and don't know how to solve, so maybe somebody here can come up with this great idea, is one silver lining of the pandemic is that the traditional um, seven to nine, four to seven rush hour doesn't really exist. Um, it's starting to creep back a little bit, but with everyone working hybrid and the opportunity for us to kind of embrace this new normal, how do we make sure that we don't return to the kind of gridlock and congestion that we had? And some of that can be coordination amongst groups like chambers. Uh, I think we really need to lean hard on our partners in the federal government who employ so many in this region to talk through their responsibility in helping us manage this kind of congestion issue uh, moving forward. So I think there are some ways that our regional and collaboration uh, efforts can help manage that. One, one more thing to add to the transportation. Um, I would encourage you to look at the visualize2045.org website. I think they just wrapped up a 30-day public engagement um, process where they were asking for input. And it's everything from biking, walking, you know, metro, buses, even airfare. I mean, it's kind of looking at the entire NCR region and transportation goals for that. So I would definitely, I think you can sign up for kind of like regular emails and they'll disseminate information that way. Okay. I'll make sure I say some time for you, Christina. Um, the, one of the things that we are trying to do, I mean, we've always had a focus, particularly in small businesses on underserved communities. Um, we recognize that they don't always consume information the same way that everyone else does. So we've even gone back to, I mean, we, we literally put boots on the ground. Sometimes we knock on doors and go see people. We put yard signs out, you know, trying to get information about what resources are available. We had to be very careful in terms of how we, we can't always take resources and restrict them for underrepresented populations necessarily, but we can target our marketing, and that's what we try to do. We make sure we see, based on the results of who comes into the programs, um, we get better representation when we use certain marketing um, mechanisms. One area of, of a, that's a challenge and an opportunity for us is um, representation in the tech sector. Um, one of the things we're working with GMU, jo George Mason, <laughs> you have to be very careful because I'm a JMU guy, um, we're working on, on how do we target angel investors, venture capital um, for underrepresented businesses to get into the tech sector because that's, there's so much opportunity there and they really are un, um, very much underrepresented in that sector. So there's gonna be more to come. There's some ideas about equity funds that we can create to, to help continue to invest. And I think some of my colleagues are doing some of that programming already, so. I'm so excited you asked this question because um, I want to tell you about all the really cool things we're doing in Prince William County. So um, first off, I may have mentioned, um, you know, uh, we are a global majority uh, board, but I don't know if you all know this, but um, in Virginia, we are the number one most diverse county and in the nation, we are number 10. So I think that is a very cool stat. Um, I think that gives our area, a uh, Prince William County, a competitive edge. And so when we think about really small business um, uh, development and helping underserved communities, you know, one of the things, let me just back up and just kind of give you a little history of Prince William County, is that prior to the pandemic, the county actually had contracted all of its small business services outside of the county. And um, right before I came on, they made the decision to actually move small business development inside. 
And when the pandemic happened, one of the things that our community that we had a big challenge was, is that we did not have a relationship with our small business community. So getting the word out um, about the micro grants, the resources, the, you know, the Elevate Workforce Program, we had, you know, the Small Business TAP Program that was very similar to what um, Tara's talking about what she, uh, or Telly, I guess, sorry, I know Tara created it, <laughs> um, very, uh, program, and, and so forth, but we, we, couldn't, we couldn't reach the community because we didn't have that relation. And as Telly said, is that we notice that marketing and distributing this material, there's different distribution channels that the underserved communities use. And so we've been trying to get very creative um, about using different channels to, again, get that word out and try to make those connections. So during the pandemic, it's been kind of a blessing in disguise um, because we have been able to really connect with a large part of our small business community and really then start to learn their stories and learn their challenges. So so one of the things that we're focused on right now is we have an RFP out um, that we are doing a barriers to success st study for all of our underserved communities. I have a vision um, that I want to be the leader in really, um, sorry guys, uh, I'm, I'm staking this, okay? I want Prince William County to be the place where any you know, uh, minority or underserved community wants to start a business, that they're coming here because we will hug them, embrace them, nurture them, and they're gonna feel so comfortable that because they're gonna just grow and thrive, and we are gonna do everything that we can to help make that happen. And that barrier success study is that first piece that's really going to identify in our community what are those specific um, action items that we can go and try to implement to make that um, that vision a reality. Uh, we're also, we are going to be working with the Community Business Partnership and uh, launching a revolving loan uh, within Prince William County. And then we're also setting up a small business center hub um, that will uh, have the Women's Center um, help with um, uh, SWAM companies as well as uh, veteran resources and try to really make that all in one place so it's easy um, and I know Jody's left but it's a, also a partnership with Mason Small Business Development Center and the Northern Virginia Community College so we're super excited about that we feel like I'm staking my ground this is what we want to do this is we're embracing um, and we really want to um, do everything we can to really help small businesses and 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 so forth so thank you Sorry, real quickly, uh, we, we offer Entrepreneurship 101 class. Uh, it's usually the first Tuesday of every month. And uh, we've done this since 2003, and we've had over 8,000 people attend these uh, workshops. And it's a way for small businesses to get started and to grow. We also offer score counseling, and we have a myriad of solutions that we offer. And what's been great with regard to the pandemic, I mean, pandemic hasn't been that great, but What's been great about this is we've had between 180 to 240 people sign up for these classes during the pandemic. And we have gone to every other month. It used to be monthly. Now it's every other month. Uh, but it has worked. And the other thing with regard to the pandemic is we no longer will have snow days. Uh, and if you're feeling sick, you just stay home, but you're still working. So thanks. <laughs> Well, I just want to thank this panel. You guys are fantastic. Uh, Northern Virginia Black Chamber of Commerce, man, you bring it, bring it on. Thank you all so much. What a what a powerhouse team here, just full of information. And thank you so much for your time and sharing everything. Um, I just wanted to say a few words about Dominion Energy. We are so happy to be a sponsor. Uh, if you didn't know, uh, we are a leader in the clean energy transition, building the largest offshore wind project in the country off the coast of Virginia Beach and also expanding our solar. So renewable energy, net zero goal, we're on it and we're happy to be here and, and happy to be your energy, energy provider. So I'd like to invite Sam Wiggins, the chair of the board to come on up. Thank you, hello everyone. Um, I had this long winded speech planned out but in the interest of time, I'm going to thank the panelists. I know one or two of you have to go because you have a conflict. You have to go, please go now. It's fine. You know, I want to thank everyone for being here. You know, I know how time goes. 
<laughs> I, I, yeah, I'll talk about you after you leave. But I know how time is, so you have to go. It's no problem. I'll take no offense. I walked out a couple times when you were talking, so feel free to do the same to me. Uh, look, I had a lot of takeaways from this. Not only am I the chairman, but I'm also a, a black business owner in Northern Virginia. And uh, wearing that hat, I learned that there are services, free services, uh, there's training, and there are actually opportunities out there that are to be pursued. I uh, also learned that you guys are committed to helping small businesses, helping minority businesses, and helping black-owned businesses. So I'll give you a round of applause for that. I really appreciate it. Uh, as chairman, wearing my chairman hat, I did see that, hey, whether you be an authority, a county, a city, an alliance, or an institution, you guys are not competing. You're working together to enhance the economy of Northern Virginia and helping <laughs> black-owned businesses, small businesses, minority businesses, anybody who wants to help. So I applaud that as well. So thank you so much. Um, I also tout the chamber, like you touted your groups. I will tout the chamber and say that this is our role. This is the role of the Northern Virginia Black Chamber of Commerce is to bring community leaders together for our members and for other small businesses who need this so that we can grow together. And with that, I'd like to also thank Sheila Dix, our executive director, and Michelle Jefferson, our board member, for making this happen. So someone said, I was mixing and mingling outside before this, someone said, hey, is this your big event you know, for the year? Uh, me and Michelle were there together. We looked at each other. Well, yeah, but it's our first big event for the year. We have many more to come, so stay tuned. So <laughs> with that, uh, thank you, panel. Thank you, audience. Thank you, Peggy, for everything. I want to give special thanks to the sponsors who contributed this event. And it's a long list, so I have my reading materials. Thanks to Sheila. And I'll start with uh, Jody Keenan, State Director, the Virginia SBDC Network, GMU. Oh, no, go ahead. Oh, well. Okay, I won't ask you to stand then. I'll ask, uh, I'll thank Dr. Hope Murphy, Inclusivity Ambassador, Virginia SBDC Network. Is she here? Oh, stand up, please. Be seen. <laughs> thank you so much. I'd like to thank, and forgive me, how they say it charges to my head, not my heart, if I say the name wrong, Celie Arqueta, Senior Business Advisor, Mason SBDC. Did I say it right? All right, hallelujah. i also like to thank Amanda Jarvis, Program Manager, Virginia SBDC Network. Also, Tori Swan, Assistant Director of Entrepreneurship Programs and Mason Enterprise Center. Thank you. Finally, I'd like to thank our Community Business Partnership at the local Community Development Financial Institution. And a special thanks to Work in Northern Virginia website, the events and programming sponsors, Trans Suburban Operative Express Lanes, that's Transurban, sorry, Transurban Operative Ex Express Lanes, the Congressional School, Google, and Dominion Energy. <laughs> well, that concludes this event. I will have Sheila give the benediction, and then we can go. <laughs> Well, everybody have a great time. Are you informed, tooled, and ready to roll in <laughs> Northern Virginia? Awesome. Well, I just, again, thank everybody for participating. Thank you to my panelists and colleagues who've been working with me, actually, for the past two years and helping me to understand and keep the pulse of what's happening with businesses in Virginia. So I'm excited about the progression and how we're moving forward as a chamber. Um, so at this time, you're free to go. Feel free to network. Um, and please always stay in tune with what we're doing. We have a golf event coming up, and uh, so if you're interested in that, we'll take some, we'll take some questions around that. And um, I just want to thank you all again for being here today. Oh, yes.
The rapid spread of the novel coronavirus led to one of the largest global economic shockwaves that we have felt in our lifetimes. For too many businesses and the individuals they employ, the impact was immediate and far more prolonged than anyone could have imagined. For households with savings, the impact could be absorbed for a while. For others, there was no safety net until our community came together and with the support of the federal, state, local government and community partners, we responded. For one family who lost their housing because they just didn't know that these resources existed, it could be many, many years before they're able to get back on their feet. And so if we could help them for a couple months pay their rent as opposed to having them potentially be homeless for years, that's a good, wise investment. And so our goal with all of our federal dollars was to get them out the door as quickly as we could. And, you know, frankly, um, because the county has built a level of trust with the community and has so many community-based partnerships and the faith communities and the nonprofit communities, I mean, we literally had an arsenal of help uh, to get that money out the door. While the magnitude of this pandemic has been global, it's the individual families and their stories that matter most. Allie and her two adult daughters were stably employed by a local hotel in March 2020, but by April, all three had been laid off. With the eviction moratorium in place, the family was safe from eviction for the time being, but they were quickly stacking up big bills and rent debt while they looked for work. Unemployment insurance payments ended when the two adult daughters found part-time jobs, but Allie continued to struggle as a shoulder injury was keeping her from returning to regular work. Critical financial assistance from the county and our community has helped pay off the rental debt they had incurred so that they are not facing eviction today. All people uh, who contribute to our economy are important. And it doesn't matter what job you have or what your income is, at the time of a pandemic, no matter how many resources you have, you still needed uh, these folks on the front line. You needed a grocery store clerk to check groceries out for your family. You needed delivery truck drivers to get products to your home. And so I hope as a result of this, in terms of affordable housing, you know, this changes the, the thought process a little bit that these are real people not just numbers of units, not just amounts of money, but real people uh, who work hard every day in our county and our community uh, that are essential to our economy uh, that from time to time need supports, need affordable housing supports, uh, need mental health supports, need other type of social supports that uh, so many nonprofits in our community can provide. Business closures have not been the sole impact to working in the pandemic. The impact on schools was severe. Maria is a single mom of two elementary school-aged boys. When the pandemic hit, she lost her job in retail. The elementary school closed and turned to virtual education. Maria had no support system to watch the boys during the day. She filed for unemployment, but the system was so overwhelmed, it took over a year for payments to come through. Unable to work because she had no child care, Maria accrued significant debt. She has now been able to find work, and thanks to community support, contributions were made to bring down some of her debt. You know, there are so many strong, uh, long partnerships we've had with community nonprofits throughout the county like Good Shepherd Housing. And so we knew at the beginning that we were going to need their help. Um, and that those partnerships were built during good times um, and during challenging times is really when those are tested. And we were tested, our community-based nonprofits were tested, and they delivered uh, for our community. With the support of our community in Fairfax County, Good Shepherd Housing has distributed over $2.8 million in financial assistance, helping hundreds of families like Allie's and Maria's. Together, with your continued support, we are able to help families who may be struggling keep a place they call home. From the very beginning, the strength of the organization was volunteers, volunteers who were giving their time and energy to make the airport 
um, all that it could be. For 55 years, we've been advocates for transportation, infrastructure for the airport, and the region. I have an article that's in the memoirs of Hal Launders, and it says rail to Dulles in 72, believe it or not. Look how long it's taken. It wasn't just the federal funds that were involved, local funds had to be involved. So it was a question of how was Fairfax and Venture Loudon going to pay their share. The landowners around Tyson's Corner finally realized that they needed rail through Tyson's. And they came up with a, a special tax district for all the businesses that owned property along where the rail was going to be. That concept went on to phase two of, of of Dulles Rail with the Dulles Quarter um, Tax District. We uh, worked with um, other organizations to encourage continued support from the business community and the state of Virginia in their participation. We spent time in Richmond lobbying for what we were trying to uh, accomplish. Uh, we did position papers on local and um, statewide issues um, and testified before local and um, state agencies and, and the legislature. Going down to, to Congress and meeting with congressmen down, and women down there to try to make sure that they heard our voices and, and knew how important this was. The Committee for Dulles has become an important part of the community. Elected officials rely on us, the public relies on us, we're able to see issues and educate people about land use decisions, economic development, and other growth potentials for the airport, which are going to benefit all of us. Well, it's been a, a, a terrifically uh, consistent in its advocacy over time, supporting both the airport, uh, rail access, road access to the airport, uh, the growth of cargo traffic, and the growth of passenger traffic. During my term, they were just beginning, or just in the middle of construction for the phase one of the uh, interchange project on Route 28. Uh, that's something to celebrate. We worked on that for years. Now that project is complete. We worked very closely uh, with uh, the Smithsonian to, to try to do whatever we could to ensure that the Air and Space Museum become located at the, in the Dulles Corridor. The official announcement of the building of the Air and Space Museum was done in May of 1999 by Admiral Ingen, the head of the Air and Space Museum, and he did it at a Committee for Dulles luncheon. In fact, there was someone that was in attendance when it was over that donated a million dollars to to the Air and Space Museum that day. We uh, uh, have maintained or, or gained uh, international recognition from markets outside of our country. Uh, most, most famously is the uh, Frank Frankfurt Airport. We met with teams from Geneva, Switzerland, who wanted to know how a community organization can help the airport. We also met with teams from Paris, France, about how to connect two airports and citizen engagement and public advocacy to the benefit of the economic development of a nation's capital's airports. When you look at the airport um, itself, it's tough to think about 12,000 acres as having a sense of community. It's an awful large area. It's a, it's a huge amount of um, land area, infrastructure, employees, uh, but every event that is held um, either by the authority, by the airport, or through the committee events, you really get a sense of pride and contribution to the community. Our events are there to promote and foster the growth of Dulles Airport and to keep the communities aware and educate them on the future economic development of the airport and its environs. If it's a luncheon or if it's a gala or if it's uh, a, you know, another event, you'll have a significant representation of the various industries in our region and it gives us an opportunity to share uh, uh, not only how, uh, what we do, but how we can help them. I asked the question, you know, is there any way we could leverage this group um, to help the community? And that's when the Committee for Dulles Community Outreach was born. Number one priority would be to give scholarships 
to deserving high school seniors. Every year we give 15, 20, 20 plus scholarships to students, uh, all who are connected to Dulles Airport. And then we also supported the um, Interfaith Chapel and the Traveler's Aid organizations at the airport. 100% of the money that we, uh, the, the uh, outreach committee uh, raises goes back to the community. Whether it's the community outreach scholarship fund uh, or the run on the runway uh, or the plane pool, uh, you really get a sense that this is a tight community that, that supports itself. The relevance of the Committee for Dulles is more important today than ever because of the growth in international business and the growth in data centers in this area, we have become an even bigger economic engine and not just the airport, but the services that are around the airport and all of the national and international companies that have headquartered here. Okay, here we are, we've accomplished so much. What is it that we want to accomplish working with the airport? How do we move forward as a partner with the airport? Uh, the pandemic, in my mind, um, forced us to be more creative, uh, forced us to be more innovative, and to move forward with the way that we uh, touched the community. Obviously, with the pandemic over the last years, there's been some erosion in uh, passenger loads, uh, passenger frequency, flights, and what have you. So there's the opportunity to try to continue the path upward to the ultimate capacity of the airport, which I'm told is in the range of 55 million passengers per year. And as you have more planes, it can impact residential areas uh, to a greater extent. So we are a strong supporter of making sure that our local communities do not enact land use decisions that put people in the flight path of oncoming or departing uh, air, airplanes. That's something that we tried to work on as well as the ground transportation for access to and from the airport beyond rail. We still see a continuing role for Committee for Dallas. Uh, someone who's looking at the airport and always trying to think, how can this get better? How can we improve Dallas to become part of an even bigger part of the Washington economy? My expectation is the Committee for Dulles will go on for many years to come.